I'm going to talk to you about the G77 in China. It is an extremely important negotiating body within the, within the United Nations. Now, it's not active in all the committees. For instance, the first uh, committee that deals with security issues, there's no G77. The G77 is very active in the second committee with the economic issues, the third committee with human rights issues, and then, of course, the fifth committee. The sixth committee sometimes has G77 in China position. The sixth committee is the legal committee. Um, if you so wish, I'm not going to tell you about who the G77 is and the fact that they have 134 countries and how they started, why they are the G77. You can Google it. Yeah, their website is actually very good. You can also Google the statements. The statements are their presidential statements, statements on the... Um, different committees, etc. So I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm going to tell you about my experience and why the G77, although a lot of, uh, there is a train of thought that says it's defunct, but it is still alive and well. If the G77 are 134 countries in the United Nations, that's about two-thirds of the membership. So if we have the numbers behind us, we don't want to put it as a threat that G77, this is the position, if we vote, we're going to outvote you. Because in the UN, we try to achieve consensus, and that is also the G77's priority, is to achieve consensus. In some other committees, consensus is like if most of the member states agree. In the fifth committee, it's 100% consensus. If you have one country that does not agree, you really discuss the issue until there's 100% consensus. Now you can imagine with countries, especially some of the Arab countries, that of course you know the Arab Spring, their scale of assessment has gone up, but currently they're in financial straits because you pay sort of backward looking on what your economic position was. So when it came to the scales, they wanted to change. But if you looked at the bigger picture, if the, you change to suit them, 90% of the G77 and China membership will be negatively affected. So we had to get consensus on that one, which is, which is rather difficult. Um, you can, the, the G77 statements are also on the webcast if you wish to, to look at how it's being delivered. I think that there are a few things that for me as a chair, I must tell you, for me it was with fear and trepidation that when they announced and I assumed the seat, if you want to put it that way, because it's an enormous task. And you must always remember that you're not there to dictate, you are there to lead the group, to coordinate the group, to facilitate. If you start dictating, the membership will make it extremely difficult for you and you will end up splitting the group. The group is not a homogenous group. Within the group, you have Africa, you have the Grulacs, the Latin American and Caribbean, you have Asia Pacific, and even within those groups, you have subgroups. All come there with their own mandates, with their own priorities, with what they want to achieve. So you can just imagine getting consensus within the Africa group on some, on some issues is, is quite difficult. But, as I said, we did quite well. Uh, the chairship, chairship of the G77 in China rotates uh, between the Africa group, Latin America, and the Caribbean, and the Asia Pacific. We took over from Bolivia. Um, Thailand took over from us, and currently it's Ecuador. Um, the, I think what is important to remember about the G77 in China is there is a ministerial declaration. Just before the start of the General Assembly, um, the whatever session, there's a, a ministerial declaration. And from there, you derive your marching orders, if I can put it that way. You then see what is the G77's position on the issues that will be discussed in the separate committees within the General Assembly. So you take your guidance from there. It's also a good a guide for the partners who we negotiate with, the EU and then the individual ones like uh, Russian Federation, Mexico, 
to see where the G77 is going and to also prepare. Um, <coughs> uh, let me see. We work on consensus. The strength of the group lies in its unity. Like I said, we, especially in the fifth committee, because it involves other people's purse, we don't want to vote. Um, because you can imagine if somebody tells you how to do your budget, it's, it's, it's not going to go down well. You want to negotiate and so on. So uh, the unity of the group, and then also if we can say to the, to the partners that we're negotiating with, the group has consensus on this, they know. Um, also something to note, the G77 focuses on economic issues. So issues of security, etc., is not. It, it's a bit of a grey area, but the main focus of the G77 in China is on economic issues. In the practicality, um, it is it is a challenge, as I said, to 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 preside as the chair. Although I actually liked the Spanish version, presidente. <laughs> yes. Um, it is the responsibility of the chair in the specific committee to coordinate the group. So, when we start off the statement, you do the draft statement, you do the skeleton. Then you send it out to the group. They come back and say, we want this added, we want this added. Then you find two opposing views in your statement. Then you have to go to the two opposing parties, see if you can reach consensus, see what is in the statement. It is rather, on a practical level, rather difficult because not all, like myself, English is not my first language. So, and the nuances there is what kills a resolution. Um, so you have to sort out this language and you try, because UN language is not proper English, you probably have discovered that when you re read the resolutions. You now have to, because, you think for yourself, if English is not your first language, you go to your first, you go to your mother tongue. You translate it into English. So maybe there's a disconnect because of what you, what you actually want to say and what you are saying on paper. So to sort that out between the groups, the different languages, is sometimes a challenge. But we get there. The same goes when we have negotiated and there's a call for language for the resolution. The same goes. We send out the draft. There's usually what we call a skeleton resolution or the the technical issues that have to be in and then the members come and put give their input. It can be very difficult to sometimes, although we, we don't negotiate amongst one another in the G77, we debate the issue in order to reach consensus. Then you might get in the two opposing parties, get them to find some consensus. And I must say the group is very good in that. Even they, they work hard to reach that consensus, but they do. Again, it is not the, the chair's prerogative to dictate. The opposing countries must find their own solution to this. When you chair a meeting as well, it's not the responsibility of the chair to answer the question. In, if, if there's some, where are we going on this? It's not the chair to say, are we going this way, unless it's an agreed position. Some of the issues, because they are reoccurring, we have agreed positions. During the last session we did this, do you want to move? But again, it's not for the chair to say we are continuing with last year's position. It's for the chair to say it's open to the group. Do you wish to continue with the position during last session? Do we open it for debate? It's for the group to decide. Um, in the fifth committee, strangely enough, one of the issues that I introduced was a written agenda. And it helped extremely in focusing the group, because you would have them all over the place. So it's very good to have, it, it's, it's a lot of work. We have coordinating meetings every week, coordination meetings every week. And um, it, it's, you have to do that between all your other issues, but it helped enormously to focus the group there was a bit of um, resistance in the beginning, um, but then they saw the value of this and now they demand written agendas every time. The statements of the G77 in China, it's very important to ensure 
that before the statement is delivered, it was circulated to the group in its entirety. It's very easy to fall into the trap with a country approaching you and say, you know what, just add this paragraph. Those negotiators are sharp. It's, uh, like I say, it's a very technical committee. Those negotiators are sharp. Some of them have been there for a long time because the fifth committee is so technical. So fine, we can add it, but I'm not going to deliver that paragraph unless it's been circulated to the group. Now, with the fifth committee, had very strange hours. Like I said, Christmas to us was a mere suggestion. We <clears throat> used to break into informal groups, sit on the couches, have the main negotiators thrash out an issue. Now we have to change position that the G77 took. Now we have to change that position because we see we're not going to move. The partners, they're going to give a bit, we're going to give a bit. But there's a change nonetheless in the position of the G77 in China. The negotiators can't accept it, even though it's 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, you haven't bathed for three days. Even though it's sort of your instinct to say, you know what, whatever. The main negotiators have to come back to the group, so we put it to the group. Sometimes it means 15 people, because those are the only people that are there at 3 o'clock in the morning. But still, your electronic statement goes and you say, the email goes out and it says, this is the change in position, we want to add this paragraph or change this paragraph, so that there's a record, at least you did circulate it to the group. The group knows, it sounds very dictatorial, dictatorial at the moment, but the group sort of knows on the fifth committee that is how things. Other committees negotiate differently, and um, especially on the Security Council, but other committees have more time. But we are pressed for time because if we don't agree, the, the UN can't implement the budget, and that, as you know, is terrible. Uh, when you are the chair of uh, the G77, you have to be in all meetings where the G77 is represented. It doesn't mean you're the negotiator. More often than not, you are literally the chair. You have your main coordinators um, who take the resolution forward. You have your specialists focusing on certain issues. So, but you have to be there because if there's any change, if your negotiators sense there's a change, we ask for a break and meet outside on the couch to discuss. Or the, the partners come with another proposal. The main negotiators can't, unless it's really against the position of the G77. If it is something we can consider, they must come back to the group. We ask for a break in the negotiations. They come back to the group. We discuss it. We decide yes, no, or change it so that it suits the group. Uh, there's also ambassadorial meetings. Um, the ambassadorial meetings mostly is um, uh, a roundup of what has been happening in the General Assembly for the various um, re committees to report, and then if there is, there are um, stalemates or if there are difficult situations, uh, they they discuss it. On the fifth committee, I'm not sure about the other committees. On the fifth committee, we do we prefer to deal with our business within the committee. We prefer not to send it to our permanent representatives because they might have a different view. They have not been following the negotiations. The important part is that you have to keep your PR informed. Your permanent representative his sphere of operating is much larger than yours. So he's at a cocktail party. He hears about this Russian paragraph in the fifth committee. And he doesn't know what it's about. You're done, like yesterday's toast. Because you have to inform your ambassador, even if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, ambassador, the Russians have proposed this paragraph. It's unacceptable, number one, for South Africa, and number two, for the, for the G77 in China. This is what it's about. So that he just knows what's going on. So that, as I say, as if he's confronted, that that um, that he knows what's going on. Um, and also, if if as the chair of the ambassadorial meeting, that he knows how to guide the the, the committee through it. It is very difficult if you are the chair of the G77 in China to also push your national position. 
that is extremely, extremely difficult. Especially if South Africa has a strong position on something, you either have to say, I now speak in my, capacity, in my national capacity, which is very difficult. You then, what we usually do is request a colleague to sit in, and you as the chair then say, I give South Africa the floor, and he pushes the position. But it is rather difficult, especially if South Africa's position uh, suggests a change in the G77 in China. On the, on the positive part, the Secretariat of the G77 in New York is excellent. They um, are the custodians of previous resolutions and drafts and everything. Everything is uh, held by them. They're not part of the negotiations, so the Secretariat. But if you go to them and say to them, you know, I have difficulty in drafting this statement, they say, you know, in 1966 we had more or less exactly the same position. And this is the statement that South Africa did, and this is the statement that so-and-so did. So then you can use that as your starting point because we like to refer to it as agreed language. Because if you take it from previous statements, previous resolutions, you know it's agreed language, so that's safe ground. But sort of just make sure that since 1966 maybe a few things might have changed, but it is good. They are also good. They're up with us at 3 o'clock in the morning. As I said, they, they send out the emails whether people read it or not, but they do it. They are extremely good. In general, the group must find the consensus on its own as a group. The chair is not there to dictate. The chair can facilitate, coordinate, but the chair cannot dictate. As I said, the group is very strong. They will quickly tell you that you are the chair. All parties must be heard. Um, as in every committee, you have sometimes um, some of the delegates that, that can um, tend to take over the floor, but still, every country, every delegation must be heard. It is important to give every stakeholder equal opportunity. There's often, especially the LDCs, the least developed countries, the landlocked LLDCs, the SIDS, they often complain, nobody's listening to us. They, you not, the G77 is not incorporating their views. So be very careful, because as I said, it's not an homogenous group. And there are subgroups within the group, so make sure that they are heard as well. Because, as Sipo said, it's one country, one vote. Whether you are Nigeria or Lesotho, your voice is equal. What was very difficult in the G77 in China when we took over the chair was discipline, may I say that. And um, we actually surprised the EU when they walked into the room and the G77 in China was waiting for them, tapping the foot like they usually do. That is, is very difficult to install discipline. It is, they are member countries, they are independent, but still, if you, the meeting starts, everybody wants to finish business, so that, so we did that. The delivering of a statement, um, Colleagues, it's not as easy as it sounds. It says, you know, you just read off your paper. You know. Try and do that when you suddenly realize you're on TV, all six your double chins are reflected, and, and you're having a bad hair day, and you want to go like this. No, it is difficult. For your statement preparation, if it's possible, it is possible 90% of the time, Take it home the night before, read it to the mirror. You must also remember to talk slowly, because whatever in whatever language you are presenting it, it's being translated into five other languages. So even though we give them the hard copy, they still have to translate this. So just spare a thought to the interpreters. I'm sorry, it has to be interpreted, not translated. So also... <laughs> Make sure that you arrive on time, because there's nothing worse than having to deliver a statement when you just ran five blocks. Now it has, <laughs> look, I can tell you everything that happened. It has happened. You have to quickly go back. You have to do this. You, know, you arrive. You actually turn blue in your face, because you don't want to go to, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity. You want to be composed. 
but you still you're out of breath. I tell you, yeah. And when your ambassador has to deliver the statement, make sure that you have at least seven copies with you and one on memory stick. Because somehow between coming through the door and taking the seat behind the flag, he might lose the statement. You can't say, oh, oh, I'm so sorry, I... No, you just have to... So, but that's the... Only when you look back at it, you realise that those were the fun times. Um, it happens to other delegations, was not just the permanent representative, I'm not saying he's the bad one. Like I say, statements get lost. Uh, yeah, so just make sure that you have a lot. Uh, also, in the committee, I think South Africa is very privileged in that sense that we have a lot of different cultures, traditions, beliefs. So most of us are tolerant and understanding of those beliefs. In the, in the G77 as well, you have a lot. So you must have uh, respect for Yom Kippur Day, uh, Fesak, uh, Eid. Uh, you must remember that when during Eid you go to a reception, it is slightly different than when you go to an ordinary reception. Um, you're not going to go to the mission in Saudi Arabia and ask why is there no wine. So just remember that you are dealing and you are a diplomat. So uh, you have to take this into account. And um, as my one colleague reminded me, a diplomat knows no seasons, so you will be sweating it out in your jacket and for the men that tie. <clears throat> we also assist um, with the uh, G77 in China on the fifth committee. There are a lot of requests for unpacking some of these very difficult uh, technical issues. So we then also arrange prior to the session meetings with the uh, board of Auditors or um, anybody that wants to explain to us. We are, of course, inundated by these requests because everybody wants more money. So they try to lobby the Fifth <coughs> Committee uh, to make sure that uh, you involve everybody, that it's open to the group, that they are there. Um, one thing that the chairing the G77 in China has, uh, or a few things that it has taught me, is never reply in anger whether or frustration whether it's verbally or non-verbally. Go have a smoke break, just take five minutes, but never just reply off the cuff. You will regret it. Because when we do that, especially out of frustration, we tend to write the wrong things. You are dealing in the international community, so be very aware of it. On a personal note, what it has taught me is to listen to people in order to understand and not to reply. I think I'll just repeat that. Mm -hmm. to listen to understand and not to reply. As I said, you as the chair is not there to solve everybody's problem. The group has to solve it. So you have to listen to understand so that you can say, okay, this is your position, this is your position. Maybe the consensus between the two would be the following. Also, sometimes a delegation objects you must understand why they are objecting. Is it, because, is it the national position? And one day I spoke to one delegate who was rather difficult. And he said to me, the problem, I have a problem with the word endorse. When we translate it back into Spanish, it's like law. For us, endorse is not law. So they had a problem with the word endorse in that specific context. So we just added the synonym for endorse and they were happy with it. So listen to understand what his problem or his issue or his objection is. Um, it was a humbling experience. I was very privileged. What is very strange is that the, we chaired the G77 in 2006, 2007, and the lady who also did the fifth committee was also Karen, or Karen as you called in America. So when I assumed the chair, they said, you know, do you only send Karens to chair the G77? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, but it was good. I just want to say to you that in, don't underestimate 
the value of the group. Don't un underestimate your position as South African delegate in the G77 to get the consensus. We still have a voice and we should use it uh, optimally. I'm going to approach this question of protocol and etiquette diplomacy in action in three ways at three levels. For the Waterberg guys, I'm going to start on the basis of what my colleague Mr. Siakamela said in his introductory remarks when he acknowledged Karen and I. And then I'm going to take that and relate it to diplomacy in action. And then we're going to take diplomacy in action and relate it to Karen's presentation on the G77 and touch on a few parts of what she said. I'm then going to take that and link it to what you are doing this year the substance of what you are doing. So let me start from Mr. Siakamela's comment. In his introduction, he said, I started with Tyrone in the department. We came for our interview together. We became friends and colleagues, and here we are today. And throughout our career, we've always connected. Whether he was in New York, I was in Mali, whether I was in Malawi and he was in New York, we connected. And that was because we built relationship. We built relationship. Now I'll tell you why that is important later. Let me start with the question, what is diplomacy? You can go to the Oxford Dictionary. You can listen to Gareth Cliff on 5FM who said the diplomats drink wine and cheese and don't know how to drive. <laughs> or you can ask Karen that diplomacy means sometimes you don't do your hair before you get to speak. Or you can ask Mr. Siakamela, who had to go as part of a delegation to Timor-Leste and had to travel by helicopter. For some people, getting onto a plane is a non-starter. So diplomacy is about representing your country and knowing that every single action that you take represents the aspirations of the people that you represent. We don't just go to cocktail receptions. Sometimes we have to serve in countries where there isn't something called a cocktail reception. And representing your country <coughs> diplomatically means that you constantly have to carry yourself in a manner which represents the highest character trait. Let me give you an example. Sipo and I are friends. Within this building, if I see him in the welcome center, oh, hola, 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 hola. who's it? Who ring him, chan? <laughs> we don't do that. If I meet him on the weekend in Aman's Kral, I'll say, hola, who's on? <laughs> but when we are here in the reception, I say, morning, Sipo, how was it? How was your weekend? Because we are constant, constantly being observed, yeah. not just by those who come as interlocutors, but those around us who select us to represent our country. So diplomacy is constant. Protocol and etiquette is constant. I don't come here on a Monday if I was with him on Saturday and say, hey, yar, when we moved on Saturday. We don't do that because we constantly are reminded that we represent something. And we represent those who sometimes cannot represent their own interests. Diplomacy in action. Now, that is internal. Now, in the UN system, as Sipo spoke so eloquently about, you have to interact. You have interlocutors. Sometimes, with countries that you don't share a similar position on, but you have to draw the distinction and whether you disagree with the position that the diplomat represents or you don't like the diplomat. And sometimes, as my father used to say, if you want to bring someone to where you are, you must go and collect them so that they appreciate the journey. When diplomacy is in action, as Karen said, as part of her experience in the G77 and China, is sometimes there are those smaller countries within a group who feel like they don't have a voice. So in negotiating with them to appreciate your position, you go and start and understand what are their national priorities. 
what are their domestic challenges and if you are crafting something how do you ensure that you factor their concerns into your joint resolution without compromising on your national interest and we do that to something in peacekeeping support is called confidence building mechanisms but in relationship building it's called a trust building mechanism the party that you are dealing with must trust that you have their best interest at heart while you are taking care of your own interest now how does all of this relate to why you are sitting here today in the coming weeks you are going to be simulating what happens at the UN and this year you have chosen within the context of the sustainable <coughs> development agenda the 2030 agenda you've decided that you want to focus on climate change and you chose top 21 the congress of the parties in particular the outcomes of that congress of the parties the paris agreement now therefore it's not a coincidence we didn't just see sipo walking in the paris say hey come we need someone to talk it was targeted because his practical experience the answers telling you about the organs was all to ingratiate you into something that you haven't experienced yet we wanted to share with you practically how it happens karen wanted to tell you that at three o'clock in the morning you call your ambassador and say we've come to this agreement and we want you all going forward when you get allocated member state you will be representing for example Cote d'Ivoire or you Eritrea and you are now going to be representing a particular country which means first of all you have to go and read what is their position on climate change what position did they take in the Paris Agreement did they were they part of the G77 in China position or did they form coalitions with someone else so that when you simulate these things in preparation for your final event that you factor in what our colleagues have said to you the way that things happen the manner in which you should draft a statement and to do that don't just know about your country Karen has told you that the G77 has webcasts that you can go on to their website read we urge you to read because it's not enough just to be smart you have to practice being smart and that's what Sipo said in one of his statements. We come academically, we come hard and we start... <clears throat> but then when you actually start doing it, when you start doing diplomacy, you realize that the manner in which you work in this group, you're going to be three or four people representing South Africa. Some of you will feel very strongly, some will keep quiet. How do you treat that person who keeps quiet? as if they are an LDC in a group, how do you give them voice? The teamwork. Because one of the things that we wanted to do going forward is to institutionalize this training with students. You have significant potential. We wanted to share with you experiences that will strengthen your ability to participate in this program, especially because funding for this program is in jeopardy not just from specific quarters but overall funding is not drying up and unless we institutionalize it and polish this marble we make this product something that those from the outside look in and say this is something that is well done well coordinated and the level at which the student participated is higher than we've seen before we run the risk of making you a vulnerable group so I wanted to say one or two things about the subject you have chosen is climate change a threat to international peace and security when you're designing your model your modalities for what organs what subcommittees how do you structure you need to sit down and ask yourself a the question on the basis of Mr. Siakamela's presentation. Is climate change a threat to international peace and security? What is the relationship between climate change and the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda? Is there a correlation? Is there a nexus? 
how are you going to position yourself to debate this issue? And I'll stop there because I think between the, my colleagues, <clears throat> you have been given sufficient tools to go, go back now and say to yourself, when I get allocated my member state, or when I get allocated my organ or whatever group I get, have I been given sufficient information to build on to ensure that we make this an excellent product? So for me, diplomacy is about doing, and doing deliberately. As Karen said, listen not to reply, but to understand. When you go and do, do deliberately so that you understand the basis on which you have done something.